So we have a, another patient, he's 58 years old. He has a four millimeter lesion on the MRI and he has a Gleason 6 prostate cancer. His urologist is pushing him to surgery and he is saying, I wanna do active surveillance. So the urologist said, okay, well, let's get you another scan. Um, and, and he's really pushing him, but he's like trying to use imaging as an excuse to kind of push him into this. Do you have any advice here for what he should do? Does he need imaging again if it's already been confirmed on the Gleason grade? Well, we do annual imaging in men that are um, on active surveillance. We always wanna make sure that the four millimeter lesion matches the same location as to where the MRI says that the uh, Gleason 3 plus 3 was diagnosed. Make sure that there was not a, another lesion that was never biopsied that could indicate higher grade disease. But assuming that there is a concordance between the, the biopsy findings and the MRI, uh, then uh, we merely get an MRI annually and make sure that that four millimeter lesion isn't changing or growing. And if it's stable, then we simply get PSAs twice a year and do MRIs once a year, and we continue on the monitoring process. If the lesion starts to evolve or change in some fashion, then we recommend that they have a targeted biopsy to make sure that the Gleason score hasn't changed. But as long as it remains 3 plus 3, we know that particular variant does not spread, then active surveillance is really the preferred approach. So I've heard it said that there's a 10% chance that an MRI can miss clinically significant cancer. Are you concerned about that percentage? It certainly is uh, a concern. The, uh, a well-performed random biopsy misses 20% of clinically significant cancer. So we've been dealing with these uncertainties and ambiguities for decades. And uh, how is that problem handled? Well, before we had MRIs, people would get re-biopsied on a regular schedule. Every two to three years, they would have another biopsy, and then, and then another biopsy, and if there was a problem with uh, cancer lurking in a corner, presumably at some point it would either get bigger and get detected on the biopsy, or perhaps the random needles would end up in the right place finally and find the the more concerning cancer. The good news was that that delay in the active surveillance clinical trials that have been done did not translate into people having cancer spread or dying sooner from prostate cancer. Studies have clearly shown that people that get immediate treatment and people who do active surveillance for a period of time and have treatment later have equally good outcomes. The way we handle that with the MRI deficiency, 10%, as you said, of the men um, have uh, some clinically significant cancer that's being missed by the MRI is to repeat the MRI annually. And if there is a smaller lesion that is higher grade and should be diagnosed at some point, presumably it will enlarge, grow, and then become detectable on the MRI, and then a targeted biopsy can be done. This uh, is one way that we handle that problem. The other way that we handle the problem, of course, is people get regular PSA testing. And if the PSAs are starting to act in a fashion that the PSA density is out of range, where the PSA is higher than it should be for the size of the gland. That could also precipitate further activities such as getting a PSMA PET scan to make sure that there's not sites of cancer in other parts of the prostate that are undetected or God forbid anything outside the prostate. So what would you suggest to patients who are being pushed into surgery by the urologist? It seems like a very common trend in prostate cancer. Well, urologists are pretty much the, uh, there are very few medical oncologists that specialize in prostate cancer. So uh, people are going to be working with urologists in the active surveillance process. Fortunately, most have been trained that active surveillance is a reasonable option. It's not surprising that surgeons want to do surgery. And uh, I think when the patients express a firm commitment toward active surveillance uh, and assuming that the profile is reasonable for doing active surveillance, then um, usually the urologist will come around. Uh, sometimes, you know, with any relationship, it uh, doesn't matter, doctors, plumbers, electricians, things just don't seem to be clicking and communication is not good and there's uh, certainly that is a situation where you th should think about changing doctors but uh, I think that's partly the um, pathway of least resistance the surgeons doing a lot of surgery let's just cake this prostate out and they tend to see it kind of as a minor procedure which it really isn't and it has a lot of long-term ramifications which we've covered before in previous videos but the situation of Doing active surveillance is usually going to rely on having a urologist supervise, and then you just need to find an individual that you're comfortable with. 
So speaking of surgery, oftentimes we also see that patients think that robotic surgery is better than the standard surgery performed, you know, just with normal hands, um, and that there are better cure rates. And so is that true? No, uh, the cure rates are the same, but uh, the surgery is a little uh, less daunting because the, uh, the length of the scar from someone who has open surgery, non-robotic surgery, goes all the way from the lower part of the breastbone down to the just above the uh, the pubic bone. So it takes long to recover from that operation, and uh, and it's a lot bigger deal. So robotic surgery is advantageous in that people are going home from the hospital in one or two days instead of three to five days. But the long-term effects, which we all care about, are good control of urinary function and the return of uh, normal sexual function. And in a number of studies, it's been clearly shown that robotic surgery has the exact same frequency of problems as the older standard open surgery uh, approaches. So both surgical approaches, unfortunately, don't match what can be achieved with modern radiation therapy, where there's practically no incontinence at all and far less impotence. So, um, and then of course you get to sidestep a, um, a b pretty big operation, even if it is a robotic operation. So there is small incremental advantages of robotic surgery over the older open surgery, but unfortunately the things that really matter, like sexual function and urinary function, have not improved. Thanks so much for watching. If you would like more information about prostate cancer and all sorts of education, you can visit our website, pcri.org, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer education videos every week. Thank you.